pretty rambunctious crowd we have here this morning. Good to see everybody, and uh, I guess the calendar tells us it's something new, I guess. Happy New Year, because it's so different than last year, right? Right? Well, we still have the same hope we had last year, and uh, welcome to church. This is uh, one of the big reasons why we come. Uh, one of the announcements uh, today, we have a new study, being a new year. We'll go into the clean pages. Study of Exodus. There is uh, the study journal that uh, we've been getting fairly accustomed to. That is something that I uh, have asked that people kind of get on their own or kind of team up with a neighbor or friend or whatnot. CBD is a good option. Uh, go there and, and look up the, uh, the study journal. If you need any help, Steve, uh, Kathy, I'm sure Lisa, she's a bit of a pro on ordering things online, so she could probably help you out. So welcome, everybody. Good morning, church, and happy new year. If you will, please stand as we sing a new song, Hope Has a Name.
God, we praise you for who you are. We praise hallelujah for you are with us, for you cannot be moved, and that we rest secure in you and your faithfulness, despite our circumstances, despite our, our ongoings and our environment. Lord, as we open the scriptures now, I pray that you would draw us close to yourself, 
that we would understand more about who you are, how much you love us, your people. Open our eyes and our ears to your truth. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to those of you here in person, made it through the chilly, icy snow this morning. Uh, and those watching online, welcome. Uh, especially for those of you watching online, we are going to do communion. We're going to celebrate communion at the end of today's service. Uh, so grab something to uh, make that happen uh, at home. Uh, those of you here, if you don't have it, uh, throw a hand up at some point or go back and grab one. Um, Jason can take care of you. But Happy New Year! Yes? Bye-bye 2020. Seems like every single article you see on the news these days and everywhere is see you later, and then you wake up it's the 1st of January and it's, everything's kind of the same. Um, but I want to ask you, what's one image of 2020 that sticks in your head? I, I got one. Um, and I'll just share it with you because I, I, you know, it was such a picture for me. So as those of you know me, I, I have a, a nine to five job. I kind of consider it a bit of a side hustle to this. Uh, I run a software company in Scarborough and I was going to take Thursday off. But this year has been a tough year for our specific industry and uh, a couple of my employees that come into the office said, hey, on New Year's Eve day, let's do brunch and uh, we'll do a socially distant brunch. There's only three of them that wanted to do this and we'll just say goodbye to 2020. And I was like, okay. So I got up in the morning and I usually do. I went into the office really, really early. And because it was a kind of special day, weird day, I stopped at Scarborough Grounds, got myself a nice large coffee to start my morning. I sat down at my desk, began to enjoy said coffee, and my desk is laid out. I've got two big monitors and a laptop and keyboard and everything going. Do you know when, as you fill your mouth with a liquid, a cough starts right here? You know, and then it's the one where you're like, I got this. I can, I can, I can, I can squelch this. I have the power. And I thought I did. And then I realized I didn't. And I thought, well, maybe I'll cough into my cup. But Scarborough Grounds has delightful covers on. So I could, and I literally spewed a full cup of coffee over two monitors, my laptop, keeboard, mouse, papers. I mean everything covered. And it's about 6.35 in the morning, dark. And I just sat there and said, yeah. This is how we're going to end the year. And 10 minutes of swabbing every, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. I had an existential moment of saying goodbye to 2020 there. Um, but we got a new year. And we have a new journey through God's word. So we are going to be studying and going through Exodus. And so as Mark indicated in the intro, if you want to go to christianbook.com, uh, or Amazon.com and just Google Exodus ESV Journal. You'll see it. It's the one we've often had and handed out here. Grab it. Somewhere between 5 and $8. Massive help to you as we study this. Um, and so, again, and if you have trouble getting one, see me, uh, see Caleb, see Kathy. Um, we will certainly help you with that. And so we got a bunch of ground to cover today. Um, but last week, if you recall... We concluded with this idea that we need to be in constant change, in constant growth, and we need to give as much as you know of ourselves to as much as you know of God. Give as much as you know of yourself to as much as you know of God. And we said that those two things grow together. The more you know of God, the more you know of yourself. And so we want to learn about God together. We want to learn about the God who made you, who loves you, who gave his son to save you, and Exodus has so much to teach us about the God 
who saved you. And so, a commentary that's going to be incredibly useful to both David and I, you hear us talk about R.K. Hughes a bunch, and he's actually got a really good one that he did with a guy named Riken on Exodus, and, and, and their commentary starts with these words. It says, Exodus is an epic tale of fire, sand, wind, and water. And so, as we study Exodus, I just want to lay the groundwork for you. The hero of the story is not Moses, it's God. At every corner, it's God. He's the one who reveals himself to Moses as the great I am that's coming. God's the one who hears the people crying and takes pity on their suffering and raises up a deliverer. We're going to talk some about that today. He's the one who brings the plagues on Egypt, who divided the sea, who drowns Pharaoh's army. It's God doing all these things. He's the one who provides manna from heaven, water from the rock. These are all things we're going to see as we go through Exodus. God's the one who gives the law. From start to finish, Exodus is a God-centered book. And that will help us as we read it to make sure we understand um, he's at the very, very center of it. And it's also about Christ. What? Just, we'll talk for a moment. In Jude, Jude 5, Jude goes so far as to tell his readers that Jesus delivered his people from Egypt. Hmm. The Bible also tells us that after the resurrection, when Jesus talked with his disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, 27 says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I guarantee Exodus was in there. And so we're going to jump right in to Exodus today. We're going to, we're going to, um, in a message I've titled, Preserved Through Pain. We're going to look at Exodus 1, verse 1, all the way through chapter 2, verse 10. And I sent it out on the community page earlier this week. We're not going to read every verse today. I'm going to, we're going to go through the sections, and I'm going to read specific passages, and they'll be here on the screen. But we're right at the very beginning of Exodus in a title, and the sermon's titled, Preserved Through Pain. Hmm. And so I've got a main point that I want you to grab a hold of and, and, and grab right a hold of it and go on a ride with me in this passage to sit today to see how true it is. So the main point I want you to grab today is that for God's people, pain and suffering is never meaningless. He's working. This right here, as a believer in the God who saved you, has got to be muckled right a hold of and held on tight. For God's people, pain and suffering is never meaningless. He's working. So before we dive into the word, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are always so thankful for your word. We live in a world that just watches people go in every single possible different direction when they're not grounded with the truth of your word. And so we praise you for it, and we praise you for how it guides us. And so we ask that you would teach us about yourself as we continue to look through your word in the book of Exodus today. I pray that you would guide us, that you would teach us, and that your Holy Spirit would lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've taken today's uh, passage all the way through chapter 2, verse 10, and broken it up into four sections. In section number 1, I've called Beginnings, and it's in chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 7. And so, little quick history lesson, right? We're we're in Exodus, and here we start. What's going on to this point? Uh, Well, much of Genesis. But I want you to just pretty much really make sure you grab a hold of the lineage Remember this guy Abraham we keep talking about over and over and over again? Well, if you're not really familiar with the family tree, we've talked a bunch about some of it. Abraham had the son Isaac. We talked about the the sacrifice. Isaac had the son Jacob. 
Jacob's grandfather was Abraham. Jacob had Joseph and his other sons. And that is where we start today. If you recall, in Genesis, the account of Joseph being sold by his brothers. Amazing story. If you're not familiar with it, go back to Genesis and check it out. Sold into slavery by his brothers because they thought he was the biggest pain. And and I've got all kinds of great stories for you about being a little brother and being a pain. I'm not going to share them today. But they were sick and tired of him. And they said, let's get rid of him. Sold him into slavery in Egypt. Nice. Genesis ends with Joseph being a prince in Egypt. And his brothers coming to him for help because of a famine. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so right there, you see the point that we're making today. Joseph says, yeah, it was evil. You were wrong to do that. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And look at the salvation that's happening from this this famine as a result. Okay? So that's just at the very end of Genesis. And so verse 5 of Exodus chapter 1 tells us how many of Jacob's family came to Egypt to be saved. Verse 5 says, All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Okay? So the 70 people that wound up coming into Egypt to be saved from the famine, and it was not this amazing regal cast of characters. The more you learn about this family, the more it makes you wonder why God had anything to do with them at all. Judah, heard of him, was especially bad. Go ahead and look it up if you like. They had one thing going for them, just one thing. They were God's people. They were part of the promise that God had made to Abraham. And so they started in Egypt with 70 people. But the number grew in verse 7. Of chapter 1 of Exodus, it says the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. I want to take you back to the promise to Abraham. In Genesis 15, verse 5, it says that God brought Abraham outside... And, I, and this is one of the most beautiful pictures in Scripture for me. I, never, I, I, I can never get it out of my mind where God says to Abraham, look toward heaven and start counting the stars. And I really can. I can imagine Abraham go, um, okay, one, two, three. And then God's, well, well, just stop, okay? If you're able to number them, and then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. The promise to Abraham was your offspring as big as the stars. And right here in the very beginning of Exodus, we're seeing it come to fruition that the people of God are multiplying like crazy. So God is fulfilling his promise in Egypt. They're fruitful, increase greatly, and it says so that the land was filled with them. That's the very first section. Let's go to section number two, which is chapter, is chapter one, verse eight. To verse 14, talking about a new king. And so this is a, talking about the king previously loved Joseph. His entire nation had been saved by Joseph and his interpretation of of dreams and and salvation from the famine. Obviously, he didn't owe Joseph, he owed God that salvation. The credit for that salvation. And so when Joseph ruled as a prince of Egypt, the Israelites were a privileged people. And how do we know that? Well, at the end of Genesis, it talks about Jacob's death 
and Joseph went to bury his father in Canaan, and it says all the dignitaries of Egypt came with him. Joseph was a big deal, and the Israelites got a lot of benefit from that. But memories are short. Okay, and verse 8 tells us that the new king did not know Joseph. And as a result, the new king looked at the Israelites differently, and verse 9 tells us how he looked at them. Verse 9, and he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. This king was a dictator, and as dictators often are, he was paranoid and insecure, and foreigners in his land caused him to worry about being overthrown. And we see that in verse 10. Let's look at verse 10. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. What's going on here? Racism. That's what's going on here. And so Riken, in the commentary I mentioned earlier, makes a statement whoo, that makes us squirm just a bit. He says, blaming things on ethnic minorities is always convenient because racism is part of our sinful human nature. If that makes you uncomfortable, take a quick look at history. And in one of the greatest examples of racism in history, this particular king decides to enslave the immigrant population of Israel. Verse 13 tells us, So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. And continues and says, And made their lives bitter with hard service. If you're a fan of irony, we got one here for you. The amazing irony is that the families of the men who sold Joseph into slavery are now all slaves themselves. Hmm. And the text indicates that they were increasingly treated more and more harshly. It was state-sponsored terrorism is really the best word for it. So God had covenanted to make his people into a great nation. The promise to Abraham isn't, no, hasn't gone anywhere. And the more numerous they became, the more this promise was fulfilled. But, but here's a point that the scripture is very clear to tell us. Pharaoh wanted nothing to do with God's plan. God's promises meant nothing to Pharaoh. And we see that he actively pressed against it. Pharaoh is the picture of rebellion against God. Donald Barnhouse called Egypt, boy, listen to this, the greatest symbol of Satan's enmity against the children of Israel. He said the devil was in Egypt. The devil was ruling Egypt. Behind Pharaoh, there was Satan. And so while we look at this and that we learn about God, we must not forget there's a spiritual battle going on here with much for us to learn. And so as Pharaoh becomes increasingly worried about the Israelites and goes next level, in this next section, we're going to look at what Pharaoh told the midwives in verses 15 through 22. And so, midwives, what? You need to understand it in the Bible and historically. The way babies were delivered was with midwives up until about the 16th century. That's how it was for a long, long, long time. Men were not supposed to be around uh, the birth of a baby. It was considered indecent for them to be there. It was immodest, and so midwives were the way that children were delivered. And in this passage we're going to look at, Pharaoh asked these women that brought life into the world to be executioners. And there are two midwives mentioned, their names are Shifra and Pua, and they are probably in charge of the midwife guild, as it were. And they also probably served Egyptian women. It was, a it was a profession of sorts. In any case, here's what verse 16 tells us. It says this, that Pharaoh said, When you serve as a midwife, 
to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool. You kids want to know what a birth stool is? Ask your parents. If it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, she shall live. Pharaoh says to the midwives, oh, when you're delivering a baby, check. If it's a boy, kill it. If it's a girl, let it live. The males who could form an army or fight for an invaded force needed to go. And so we're familiar with this. Um, if you've been around church long enough and you had flannel graph in your history like I did, this is, you remember this story, but we need to not forget this is genocide. This is, this is the destruction and killing of babies. God is a giver of life. Satan seeks to take it. The Bible's clear on this. And this is just one of the many passages in Scripture that shows us how important life is and how wrong abortion is. And so I just want to call back to the ABBA video that we showed you guys last week. We need a different answer. And they're a fantastic ministry that we support that helps moms who might have an abortion to find a different path. As God's people, we need a different answer. The midwives had a different answer because life matters to God. These midwives' different answer was, how about no? And I just love what happens next, and I'm excited for the conversations around your dinner table today about it. The text tells us that the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. Got it. Cool. They just said, no, we're not, we're not doing that that they let the male children live. And Pharaoh's like, well, why are you letting the male children live? I thought I told you to do something. What's going on? And their answer is priceless, priceless. In verse 19, verse 19, the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they're vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. I love it. Pharaoh's like, what are you talking about? Why are the boys still living? And they're like, by the time we get there, these Hebrew women are so rugged, they've already had it, they don't even need us. Not like the Egyptian women. What? How are they able to do that? I'm going to tell you that I, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly why. I'm going to tell you that I believe that the midwives were a critical part of even, even Egyptian society. And so they were able to be sarcastic with Pharaoh because if Pharaoh got rid of the midwives, he would have a massive struggle on his hand societally and culturally and whatnot to have babies for his own people. That's my guess. I don't know why. But they're able to be sarcastic with Pharaoh. There's mockery going on here. If this were true, who needs midwives? Right? If this is true, and so I ask you a question. Did the midwives lie? But wait. It looks like they might have. Um, in subsequent verses, God rewards them. What? What? Insert quote from my brother Mike Rosenbauer here. God is big. And slippery. <laughs> there has been reams of volumes written about this verse, and I want you to go home and argue about it with your family for the rest of the day. No, this is, isn't this crazy? But what are the midwives doing? They're doing what Jesus commanded in Matthew 10. He says, and don't fear those who kill the body, but can kill the soul, but cannot kill the soul. Don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. This is a crazy verse. They're like, sorry, Israeli women are so rugged, they've already had the baby. By the time we get there, we can't do it. And they're, they're so much more rugged than the Egyptian women. So I, I love it. I love it. And the text continues, says, God, God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. God's promise and plan to see a mighty nation is happening in the midst of pain and suffering and enslavement. Do you see it? 
God's promise and plan to make a mighty nation is happening in the midst of pain and suffering and enslavement. But Pharaoh upped the game again, verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This is the final verse of chapter 1. It is Pharaoh doubling down and saying, okay, midwives, then I'm just going to have everybody, if they find a Hebrew baby, heave ho it into the Nile. This right here sets up the entire book of Exodus. The explosion of the Jewish nation, their enslavement, and the murder of its baby boys. And into this darkness, into this chaos of babies being thrown into a river, a picture that's just simply too traumatic to even imagine, a light dawns, hope is born in the birth of Moses, right? So the setup of chapter one leaves us in a place where Pharaoh is saying, kill all the Hebrew babies, just do it, toss them into the Nile. And then the birth of Moses in chapter two. And so this passage tells us that a man from the house of Levi, who eventually became the tribe that priests came from, took a wife, and they had a baby boy. And she hid him as long as she could for three months. And in an act of desperation, made a waterproof basket and placed it in the reeds along the riverbank. And in a series of events that can only be miraculous, Pharaoh's daughter found the baby, took pity on the baby. Baby's sister was watching, asked if she needed a nurse to take care of the baby. And this baby's mother gets paid to nurse her own baby. Wow. You see how this is, you see how what God is doing? He's working it out in the midst of amazing trials where genocide is happening. God is working out his plan of salvation. Verse 10 tells us, and when the child grew older... She brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses. Here he is. Because, she said, I drew him out of the water. And so begins the salvation of the the Jewish nation from Egypt that we're going to be looking at for some time here. We are embarking on an amazing journey to learn more about the God who saves Peter N. says, ironically, this child, once doomed to death by Pharaoh's decree, will become the very instrument of Pharaoh's destruction and the means through which all Israel escapes, not only Pharaoh's decree, but Egypt itself. And so I want us to see today, we've just looked at, you know, briefly at this passage. What I want us to see today, as we continue in the book of Exodus, is that there is an enormous message of hope for us as we begin a new year. I want us to understand, the scripture is very clear, Satan is hard at work. But God's promises and plan continue. And I hope you see this from what we looked at today. Satan was working mightily through Pharaoh to diminish God's people. And yet in a boomerang effect, the nation grew and grew and grew. God is able to take pain and suffering and accomplish his promises and his plans through it for his glory. And so there's a huge message of hope in this, and I want to bring us back to that main point. For God's people, pain and suffering is never meaningless. He's working. I want to get to the practical side of this now. Since this is true, that's why we're able to read Romans 5, which is an amazing celebration. And as we get into communion, I'm going to look at Romans 5 again. But in verse 3, it says we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Because we know God is working. And Romans 8, 28 just kind of nails it home for us. It says, and we know that for those who love God... All things work together for good. We sit here 
in the middle, at the, at the beginning of 2020, with 2021, with 2020 in the rearview mirror, and go, yeah, but. All things work together for good. <clears throat> the Bible teaches us this. And yet, what do we do? We stop looking up. We start looking down. And it changes our view. When we grab a hold of this truth that God's working all things for good, what's the actual result of this truth in our lives? In Paul's amazing description of love, 1 Corinthians 13, 4, what is the actual result of this truth in our lives? The very first thing Paul mentions, the very first thing Paul mentions when he talks about what love looks like in the life of a believer, the very first thing he mentions is love is patient. How you doing? The very first thing. Why? Because we know God is working even in the hard things in our lives. We're kind. We rejoice in the truth. And you say, yeah, but Steve, you need to explain to me this or that or the other. Paul, in this very passage, says, we see in a mirror dimly. I can't. I can tell you what God tells us, that God's working. Who knows what 2021 will bring? Nobody. But we know this, for God's people, pain and suffering is never meaningless. He's working. And so the best way for us to start a new year, we're going to celebrate communion. With that truth foremost in our minds, a love the new song we've added, hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And so I want to take you to Romans 5, where we just read a couple, um, a little bit from it. But I want to just use Romans 5, 1 and 2, to guide us as we start 2021 with communion. Romans 5, 1 is Paul after he's laid out what Christ has done for us and how faith in him saves us, he says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. As you begin a new year, if you've put your trust in Jesus and not put your trust in yourself to make you right with God. You hear me say it all the time because it needs to be said all the time. You have peace with God. Have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And so as we celebrate the bread, go ahead and grab your element. The Bible tells us that Jesus, when he had given thanks, he broke it. He broke the bread and he said that this, this bread, this whatever you're using is my body. This is my body, which is for you and, and, and tells us that when we do this and we know that hope has a name, his name is Jesus, he gave his life for us. He gave his body for, his body was broken for us. So to do this in remembrance of me. Dear Heavenly Father, those of us that celebrate communion, understanding that what you gave to us when you sent your son to die for us is the very fact of a relationship of peace with you. And we are, we're starting a new year, we're looking at a kind of junky year in our rearview mirror, but we want to approach this year with the very, very truth that we have peace with you. There's no war with you going on. 
and the amount of hope that comes from a right relationship with our Creator is innumerable. And so we praise you for that today, Lord. Help us to live out as we learn, 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 learn more from your word what a life of peace with you looks like. In Jesus' name, amen. And so what is a life... Does peace with its creator look like verse 2 of chapter 5 of Romans? Through him, who is Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And what do we do? We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. God has told us so much about how he works through pain and suffering that we can rejoice in hope because we know God is working things for his glory and for our joy. Scripture tells us that in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as we spend just a moment, I want to give you an opportunity to pray and ask God for help in the coming year to know and understand and live the fact that because of Jesus we have peace with God. Ask God to help you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Dear Heavenly Father, even today there are voices that scream at us. There are voices that tell us that there is not hope. There are voices that tell us that you are not good. There are voices that tell us that you aren't planning good for your people. Lord, help us to listen only to you and only to your word as we approach a new year. We want to make sure that we begin this new year with gratitude. Thank you for the opportunity to remember the sacrifice of your son. Help us to know that the peace that we have with you can guide every single piece of our lives. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. can see the promised land, though there's pain within the plan, there is victory in the end, your love is my battle cry, when my fears like Jericho, build their walls of There is 